Okay, I've got, I promised you I'd bring you this book. Um, this is my interlinear Bible. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's coded with Strong's Concordance numbers, and it's it's got the interlinear Hebrew. So you've got the Hebrew, you've got the English underneath, but you've also got it in a column next to it. And it's kind of a literal translation there. <laughs> Hebrew is kind of hard to follow because they start here and go backwards. So they start at the end and work their way back. Okay. Um, so when you're trying to read it, you've got to get used to that. It's a bit, bit goldy good if you're not careful. But, um, yeah. And then you've got uh, the New Testament uh, over here, which again is another version of the Greek with the English right underneath and the Strong's numbers. And you've got it also literally translated in the columns. Just another useful document to have if you want to do serious study. And I, I think you don't you don't have to be the black one person because it's got the English on So it's it's really a name. name so you, you could have that. Start with you all and you can pass that round. I think it's got my name in. I'm also going to pass this around. Welcome back, Wednesday. Well, welcome back, Wednesday. Begin. It will be on August 25th in the day. That's Wednesday. Yes, yeah, so it's nine. That's why it's called Welcome Back Wednesday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I nearly, the penny was fixed in the drop. I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't resist. I couldn't Yeah, so we've got tonight and then next week's our last uh, Wednesday to go. Oh. 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 We'll do it again soon. So um, sign up for that if you can bring Chick fil A. Oh, no, not Chick fil A. Well, there's a list of big dogs. I think that the church is providing Chick fil A. So, then I mean, get to case. Boy, there's all kinds of stuff. How have you done that? Sign your name on the roll, because when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Tell you, that's a favourite hymn in the prison. When I go in the prison, that's their favourite hymn. They always want to sing. Yeah. Uh, uh, announcements. Ethan Snook, 18 year old grandson of Larry Hahn, is in Covenant East 308 with COVID. He is in critical condition. He is waiting to get transferred to Baylor Medical. Which I'm kind of surprised that he didn't be critical. He's Eighteen. So, not doing well. Bobby Rhodes is in East Tower. This is Covenant East Tower five eight eight. With COVID, possibly he'll get to go home today. He didn't. Mike Fulcher, did he? Yes. Yeah, yeah Mike Fulcher. Uh, he just recovered from COVID. UMC Aaron Harper is in room three two seven. They used to members beliefs, Well, they used to be members here, but I don't think they are now. Yeah. 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 But um, I mean we can still play. Congratulations to Keith and Brittany Hudgens of Anna. Is that Anna or Santa Anna Texas? Yeah. 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 Their son read on the August 9th. Okay. He was born prematurely and will be in uh, Naiku for a week. Proud grandparents, Robert and Bernard Smith. Very great. Rex Turner started cancer treatments this week. Reportedly, he's doing okay, doing well. But Doug Hannell's dealing with health issues. He's been uh, in services for a couple of weeks. Annie's Annie's Rhodes has COVID. She's doing much better. Um, Aaron Harper's husband and, and the 
children, all home sick with COVID. Karen Roger's mum, Melba Burr, was released from hospital. Uh, has been placed in a SNF for rehab. School nursing. School nursing. Is that because of the body Yeah. <laughs> 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 Family is thankful for the prayers on their behalf. Randall and Barbara Russell at Portland, Texas. Family members of Sherry Brewer at COVID. Barbara has COVID pneumonia. Prayers for all those sick with COVID. Uh, sympathy for Robbie Templeton's uncle and Joanne Templeton's brother in law, Joe Templeton, who passed away Tuesday, August 10th of 12. Service on <coughs> I think it was mentioned last week, Floyd Price's memorial has been uh, put back to 4th of September in the auditorium. Um, welcome back Wednesday, that sheet's going around for you, uh, August 25th, there will be a meal beginning at 6.45, followed by congregational time of worship in the DAC. There will be kids' classes for fifth graders and young. It's an opportunity to meet and greet the university students till around 8 p.m. So please sign up and get on the general. Sunday night assembly will begin this Sunday at 5 p.m. We're having a special service which will be a back to school prayer time. So that'll be the nature of the evening service this Sunday. Ladies' Bible class will commence Tuesday, August 24th, with coffee at 9:15 a.m. And they haven't put it on here, but I'm sure there's going to be cakes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Concern to us, Father, but our faith uh, and our trust in your word and your promises and, and in your Son um, tells us and confirms to us that we have one who stands uh, between us and you and mediates for us, Father, and uh, even more than that, he advocates for us uh, against our accuser, uh, the devil. Uh, and Father, even more than that, he intercedes for us all the time. Father, what a fantastic, wonderful helper he is. Uh, and what good news that is to us, Father, because that's a reason for us not only to be joyful, uh, but to uh, glory in, uh, in your name, Father, for what you have provided for us. 
Father, uh, we are thankful, but we're humble also, because we know that of our own uh, personhood, uh, we're not worthy. We're not worthy of anything. We needed someone uh, to be a sacrifice, uh, uh, a peace offering for, for our sin uh, before you, Father. And Jesus was willing to do that. Thank you, Father. We're going to look and uh, continue our study tonight and we pray that you'll uh, give us ears to hear, Father, and, and hearts that are open to receive your instruction. You instruct us, Father, because you love us. You love us, Father, because you created us. Father, why would we want to do anything in this countenance, Father? <coughs> Help us, Father. You called us sheep because we have a tendency to wander, to go off in directions that uh, don't accord with your will. So, Father, rebuke us, correct us, and bring us home, Father. Bring us back into the fold and, and show us, Father, who our leader is, who our great shepherd is. Let us not err from his. Please be with those, Father, of uh, the number here, of the body of Christ. Please be with those who are suffering from illness, who are in the hospital. Bless those that are treating them and nursing them. Uh, and they make full recoveries, Father. We hate the blight of uh, illness because it's a sign of the, the curse that you placed on the world because of man's sin. We look forward, Father, to the day when all will be made new. There will be no more disease, no more wearing out of limbs and bodies, but we will be made new, Father. We will inherit a spiritual body and come into your presence forever. Father, bring that day on. I speak in Jesus' name. Right. Uh, people you want to sit in front of really need to sit in front of the We're going to um, continue our study tonight that we started last week, but I'm barely got halfway through it. Um, we looked at it. There are two forms of disobedience in, in the Bible. Uh, we looked at the first one last week, which is disobedience to God by those who um, haven't known uh, uh, And even with the, with the likes of Israel, where, where God um, showed himself to them for a period of 40 years, um, I'm sure that showing would have been a lot less had they had been obedient. Um, and, they could have gone into the promised land way quicker than they did. Uh, but they needed a, a, a firmer lesson in um, who God is and why they should only worship him uh, and why they needed to uh, break down some pretty thick walls of pride that they had. Um, and so he gave them 40 years of testing in the, in the wilderness. Uh, in the hopes that that would um, resolve things. But as we know, very few of that generation uh, that were already adult when they left Egypt, very few entered the Promised Land. Not even Moses himself. Uh, just um, two of the two guys, you remember? Okay. But there were some others. We had a few priests as well that, uh, that entered. Thank goodness. <laughs> if the priests hadn't made it, it would have been a, it would have been in a real mess. Uh, but it was a pretty poor show, wasn't it? You know, we said that God was there every day in the cloud. We, you know, every time they looked up in the burning desert, there was just one big cloud, and it was right over Israel, blocking uh, the, the, the heat of the sun, protecting like a like a covering. Oh boy, we need a covering. Um, and then at night, how was he manifested? He 
it was like a pillar of fire, wasn't it? Because they needed to feel this warmth. Wow. You know, I've sat out in, in places where they have those gas lamps and things that burn. And they, that, some of those can be pretty powerful, can't they? But can you imagine? You've got to warm up, what was it? Probably two plus million people. Um, that must have been quite a sight. And yet, that wasn't enough. They either got used to that and just took it for granted, or they plain didn't appreciate it the way they should have. And it's probably a mixture of both of those things. Um, but they're hard, how are they described by God usually? Yeah, what was it? The foreheads were made of flint. We got some of that stone down here in the, where I go in the oil field. And it's hard stone. Isn't it? The Indians used to chip away at it to, to make um, stones that they could flay skins with or, or if they could make a spear head or an arrow head. That's what their chosen tool was. Um, but it, it's hard stuff. Um, it's really hard to build because it doesn't like cement. It can soak the things for, for days and days and touch to get them to, to take to the cement. Um, but what were they next made of? The sinews? Stiff neck. Yeah, stiff neck, weren't they? Like made of iron or something. Yeah, like Terminator or something like that. Um, and, and, and why did he say that they had these, these foreheads like flint and necks that were stiff? They didn't pay attention to God. They, they were more interested in um, what they could get out of things for themselves, I think, a lot of the time. So that, that was a form of disobedience. And God, um, he, he, well, he let them carry on. He, he, he gives them pretty well, just like he gives us free to choose. Are we going to follow him? Or are we not going to follow him? Some of them, if not all of them, adults, uh, they were all covered in the blood of the covenant, weren't they? They all passed by. Um, Moses and the priest took there when they made that covenant at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus 20, I think it is, 19 and 20. Um, but most of them turned away from God. Um, there's a term that's used, in fact, I think it's the same name that was given to one of the uh, watering holes that they uh, stayed at. Um, but they had to throw a log in it because the water was bitter. Yeah, and that word bitter is mara. And there's a word very similar to it in the Hebrew, uh, which talks of this disobedience. Okay, so uh, it kind of well describes their attitude to God. Um, they weren't very thankful, they were bitter towards him. Why are you keeping us in this mess? We're throwing it, throwing it all the time. And as anyone knows, uh, you don't want to be around a moaning, whinging person every day, <laughs> do you? You know, if you have to work with someone like that, you try and kind of find reasons to go off and be up in another part of the, the building or, or whatever, uh, because it just, it weighs you down. And, and it tried and it tested God for a long time. He was worn out for that behavior. It was all he could do to stop smiting so that's one kind of disobedience. There's another kind of disobedience, though, and can anyone think what it might be? It's in relation to something. Well, there are those who are disobedient who are in the Lord, or in the Son, yes? Uh, and that tends to be talked about in the New Testament for obvious reasons. Um, although that, that example I just used is, is a perfectly good one you can use in the Old Testament. Anyone who's in covenant with God, what's the only way that God does relationship with, with mankind, with his creation? Yeah, it's through covenant. If you're not in covenant with God, you're not in relationship. Okay? It's just that simple. All right. Now, there's been quite a few different covenants over the years, and there's sometimes there have been coexisting covenants, yes? Like the one with the patriarchs was still around at the time that God made 
a special covenant with the Israelites, a chosen nation. Okay? Those two covenants coexisted for, for a period of time. Um, that's up to God how he wants to do it, but that's how God does relationship. It's through being in covenant. So what covenants are we under? Jesus. Hmm? Jesus. Yeah, the new covenant, which replaced the one that was nigh unto disappearing, even in the time of Jeremiah, when he um, prophesied about it in Jeremiah 31. Yeah, that's 600 years before Christ or so. Uh, it was already nigh unto disappearing. God had decided long before that, uh, I'm going to be having a new covenant. Because they'd already decided before the creation of the earth that he was going to provide a special sacrifice. And whatever happened in that meeting before creation, Jesus came forward and said, I'll be the lamb. I'll be the sacrifice. Which is why Revelation 13, 7 says, uh, the lamb of the sacrifice from the foundation of the world. Um, so this isn't uh, God reacting to um, unforeseen circumstances. This is God's plan, redemptive plan, working itself out according to his will. Okay. Um, so does God have to deal with disobedience uh, from his covenant people? Uh, and if so, what does it look like? Well, there are a lot of different kinds, but it involves sin. Disobedience is always, always involves sin. Uh, and what is it that God can't do with sin? He can't fellowship it. So that is automatically going to put a covenant relationship on the screen, isn't it? And it's just as well, therefore, that we have a mediator, advocate, intercessor, who's willing to still stand in our behalf. Otherwise, what would happen to that relationship every time we sit? Yeah. Uh, and why is it that we don't have that problem when we're disobedient? because of the power of Christ's sacrifice, which is why we remember the great first day of the week. Because it is the power that we need to maintain our relationship. As we look at our own lives, or at least I do, on a Sunday, and I don't very often like to sit about my performance. But I, I at least know that my performance isn't dependent on me. It's dependent on what Jesus has done. And so I'm thankful every Sunday that I'm able to partake of something that symbolizes the power of his blood, symbolizes the fact that it was efficacious, big word, um, it, it did what it needed to do to remove God's wrath towards my sin. So I don't want to face a wrath of God. Ever. Do you? Uh, the way it's described in Hebrews 10 uh, makes the hairs on my back stand up. It concerns me greatly. Uh, and it probably should for all of us, because that way it motivates us to uh, not be sheep. <laughs> not to come, come back each time. You know, Jesus knew that we needed uh, needed that time of communion every every week. He, he didn't want to make it a once a year thing. Like their atonement was under the old cup. No, it's a once a week thing. Um, um, so, but it's that all that the fact that we have this relationship tells us that God sees us through Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Even though I can be disobedient and I sin, what does it mean that he sees us through Jesus Christ? Yeah. I don't know what courtrooms look like, don't you? Um, courtroom in, in England, if if you are the um, defendant and you're in this 
box that's higher than everywhere else and you're on show for everybody okay everyone can see you that's not the courtroom i see that describes our relationship i see a courtroom if there is one here's the judge here's my representative my advocate and i'm nestled down low behind the barricade or something <laughs> and and the judge can't see me, he just sees my advocate. And he's quite happy with that, that's all he wants to see. As long as he can see the advocate, uh, I'm in good shape because he's the one that counts. Um, which is why John, speaking through the Holy Spirit, was saying in 1 John 2 1 that, um, or is it 2 2, uh, that he is. Uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the righteous, you know, that's his label. You know, if he had a law firm, that's what it would say on the, on the, uh, the entrance. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Um, that's much better than Perry Mason. <laughs> and way better than the Perry Mason that got in. <laughs> Perry Mason never used, he never used to lose a case, did he? Uh, I'm old enough to remember that show. He never lost a case. Well, um, Jesus' record is just leagues and you know, infinitely better. Because nothing really gets to court. Because the father says, I'm listening to this adversary. Because my person here, my defendant, has an advocate. He's righteous. That's a powerful picture, especially if you're familiar with the court. Anyway, I'm going to get to the passage I want to look at today. Turn to Titus. <clears throat> Titus um, chapter 1 <coughs> it's easy to read this and sort of read over it but there's some powerful stuff in here um, Paul says uh, that he is a doulos a, a slave it's that um, lowest of low term um, a servant Paul is a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So there's his identity laid out for us, his credentials. Uh, for the sake of the faith of who? God's who? His elect. What does that mean? What's his elect? Church. Yeah, it's church. Okay, the chosen people, the ones that have accepted the gospel. Okay, so why is Paul a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ? What did he just say? It's for the sake of the faith of the church. That's his purpose for being an apostle. Okay, it's so that he might build up our faith. And also something else which is linked to the faith. What is it? Their knowledge of what? of the truth. Remember all the questions I asked, the answers are always in the text. Okay. So he's an apostle of Jesus Christ that he might, well, we, we read elsewhere, edify, fortify our faith, build us up in our faith, and acquaint us uh, with the knowledge of the truth. Because without the second part, you don't get the first part. Does that make sense? Those two things depend on each other, right? And he says something about that uh, knowledge of the truth and the faith. Uh, he says it accords or agrees with what? Godliness, you say you. So if you want to be godly, what do you need? Yeah, it's got to be based on uh, the, the truth which of course to the faith of uh, the church. And, and where did that truth come from as we've studied in previous lessons together? What's it talking about? The knowledge of the truth. What else is it called? It's called the word, isn't it? The word of God. So it, it's dependent on what God's revealed about it. Okay. Um, it's in the hope of eternal life, which is the uh, where we're hoping to to end this life isn't it yeah 
the hope of eternal life because it's been promised. Um, which God who never lies, there's a description of God there. Can you trust God? According to this, yeah, he never lies. Uh, and that's because he promised it before, mine says, the ages began. You may have something similar to that. Time's right. eternal. Yeah, that's another way of saying it. I like ages began. So this was always God's plan, yes? Just not. Um, and at the proper time, because this is one of Paul's long sentences, so we kind of got to unpack it. So this, he's an apostle of Christ for the purposes of the faith of God's elect, which is dependent on their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and uh, will uh, one day will, um, I can't remember the right word, but will come out into the uh, hope of eternal life will be realized, okay? And at the proper time, this knowledge of the truth, okay, which fortifies one's faith in Christ, at the proper time it was manifested, it was shown to the world. How? In his word. Is that true? What was the promise that Jesus made to the apostles in Acts 1, verse 8? Remember, before he ascended to heaven? What did he tell them to do? Wait. Wait. In fact, he told them in Luke 24, somewhere near the end, 51, is it? Um, wait here in Jerusalem until uh, you are empowered from on high, or something worse to that effect, and he, uh, God makes you uh, his witnesses, okay, in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right there, you've got the whole purpose of the book of Acts and, and the rest of the book goes on to show you how that happens how that's fulfilled in a space of I don't know 30 odd years pretty impressive yeah so that's the promise uh, and it's the promise here that uh, the proper time um, the gospel was manifested literally in God being a man Jesus Christ God incarnate but then, through the teaching of, of those that uh, he empowered through the Holy Spirit after his return to heaven, to be our high priest of that book. And <clears throat> so it's manifested in his word, which we call here the New Testament, through the preaching. But that's not the normal word for uh, preaching. Uh, this word, kerugma, uh, describes the, um, the germinal seed, if you will, of uh, the gospel, the power of this unique message, because it describes Jesus Christ and he's our Savior, <coughs> and how he fulfilled all those messianic scriptures uh, of, that were prophesied under the old covenant times and even before. Um, and as Ephesians 3 tells us in the early verses of that chapter, that mystery that was hidden for ages that's now been manifested um, through the preaching of his word, which is also the knowledge of the truth um, and, and, and is foundational to the faith of, of the church. It was entrusted by the command of God our saviour to Paul and, and it will be to Titus as well yes because he left him in Crete to continue the work of building the church didn't he and what was the part that he left off what was the part that was unfinished he hadn't chosen elders in the towns okay so these young churches in Crete were without shepherds who was going to feed them? Could Titus go and run around all the churches on Crete? I haven't been to Crete, but my um, parents do. Mm. It's a pretty big island. It's also extremely mountainous, so it's hard to get around. The easiest way to get around Crete would be to take a speedboat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but depending on the time of year, uh, as Paul found out, because they left Crete, and that was when he had the, the big problems getting to uh, Rome and let go and buy Malta. 
Um, so I find that very helpful at the beginning there because that describes to me in very good detail the source of our faith and the purpose of the scriptures that we have. What's the purpose? Well, it's that we might increase in the knowledge of the truth. And that truth partly describes who? Christ and God. How do you know God except through the word that he's revealed himself by? Without that, we're all guessing, aren't we? You know, well, maybe God's a goat. Uh, no, maybe he's a sheep. No, maybe he's a snake. No, maybe he's a... You know, we're, we're totally lost, aren't we? Without this revelation. So he, he says to Titus that uh, there's a need there. Uh, he said, I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone's above uh, reproach and uh, the husband of one wife, his children are believers, not only to the charge of debauchery or uh, mine says insubordination. You may have a different word there. Right. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's, that's the strongest way that it's ever used. Um, but disorderly, disorderly would be um, would, would be good or undisciplined. Uh, for an overseer as God's steward uh, owes a debt to be above reproach. He, he mustn't be arrogant, quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain. But hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now look at this in verse nine. He must hold firm to what? Is that the same word that we looked at in the opening verses there? Yeah. For how is he going to feed the flock? And how is he going to stand before the flock and discern those who need rebuking because they are bringing in strange teachings or whatever unless unless he can hold firm it's a strong word to the trustworthy word so the word uh, is the knowledge of the truth it's the faith here is the faithful word the trustworthy word um as per um well yours might say as taught it, it's actually a noun there. it would be better to say as per the Teaching. Well, what teaching? I think he's referring to the apostles' teaching, isn't he? Yeah. Um, and there's a reason for that. There's a hina here that says, so that this is the purpose for all this. So that he may be able to give instruction, which is a good translation, in yours may say um, healthy doctrine, sound, 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 sound words, word, sound teaching. Um, didascalia is often uh, translated doctrine, but it can be teaching. But it's healthy. Uh, we get the word hygienic from, from the Greek word. Okay, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you kind of hope your hospital is going to be hygienic, yes? Because <laughs> you don't want staph infection. I used to wonder what staph infection was for a long time. I thought it was something that the nurses carried around. But, um, <laughs> but um, it, it's not. It's, uh, it, it's to do with hygiene. Okay. So why would you use the term hygiene in connection with the teacher? You don't want it to be corrupt. Right, it's going to be pure. The purpose of hygiene is, is hopefully to make things pure and clean, yes? And God's teaching, God's word can be exactly that, right? It can keep, what do we need to be uh, as the bride of Christ? Pure, it, pure unblemished, yeah? Um, so, so that's kind of important. So there's a means to that right there. But it's not just so that he can give instruction in um, sound teaching. It's also so that he can do what? Rebuke. That's a strong word, isn't it? Um, it can mean really to, to give a, a sound defense. Okay. Um, to those who, what does yours say? <laughs> 
What's the gain set? Well, yeah. Yeah, someone who contradicts the teaching okay, or opposes it. Okay, so that to me is a very important um, uh, purpose or, or I don't know, like term, qualification, but it's a requirement. Because in order to protect the flock and feed the flock, it needs to be able to do those things effectively. Yes. Also, you know, he's an elder's God steward. Yeah. Where did you, you say know, that? In uh, verse 7. And yeah. I think a lot of people forget that the sheep are of God. Mm. And he wants them back. Yeah. And he's. You know, they're not ruled over. Mm -hmm. You know, you're supposed to lay the elders supposed to lay their life down. Right. Sheep. Yes. Yes. You know. And Good point. So the elders will be accountable for the sheep. Right. Because they're, they're not his sheep, they're God's sheep. So, like the Hebrew writer says, we owe a duty to the elders not to make their work more impossible than it already is. Is my translation. <laughs> um, it's, it's, um, it's difficult. I, I, I want a raise. I want money for my class so I can have a nice chair to sit on. <laughs> <laughs> Dale gets a nice chair to sit on. <laughs> I'm, I'm pottering around. I'll be here for sure. See, I'm winking. <laughs> Struck there. Um, okay, so. To go back to verse 9 there, so he gives instruction in sound teaching, doctrine or whatever, and also is able to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are uh, disorderly, again, is that word, uh, insubordinate. Um, they don't listen. They're always ready to talk before they listen. Yeah. Um, fact is something I really hate. It's something I don't know. So, got to this. Uh, and people who do that are very often empty talkers. What's that? Yeah. They don't know what they're talking about. It's just hot air. Uh, but that talk can easily deceive others, can't it? And that word deceivers is a, is a strong word. Because anything that's to do with deception starts to pull you much closer to uh, a characteristic of some um, <clears throat> conversations or, or words that are literally diabolical. Say, you know, you might see it uh, described with different words, slander, um, one of them, but it's a blasphemy. To blasphemy to the doctrines of Christ. Uh, and we talked about that word a few weeks ago. That, that, that's pretty serious. So, um, such people need to be silenced. Uh, he talks about a specific group there in Crete, circumcision party, who uh, probably are Jews or I think they are. Um, because they were going around upsetting whole families, teaching for shameful gain. What does that mean? Are they talking money? Something good, power. Or power, position, yeah. pride. Both, yeah. Yeah. They're looking for, um, you know, fame and attention and stuff, they're going to get notoriety. Um, but they are uh, teaching what they ought not to teach. They owe a debt not to teach false teaching. They owe a debt to God because he provided a sacrifice for them and not for this. Uh, and then he talks about a, a Christian prophet that all the people would have known. Um, <laughs> that's not a very good epitaph for your country, is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not much nationalistic fervor in saying that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy drones. This testimony is true. Um, and having lived in southern Europe, uh, I know there's some truth to that. It spread beyond Crete, trust me. Um, rebuke them sharply, therefore. Why? What's the purpose of rebuke? 
council review got to be carried out so that they may be sound in the faith. So you're not giving up on them, but you're giving redress to some serious um, problems, yeah? But it's with a redemptive purpose. And, and I like that because I know for sure if it's redemptive, it accords with God's will. Because we serve a God of redemption. Okay. Um, and what is it going to cause them to be, hopefully? Sound, healthy, hygienic in what? The faith. Not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from what? Okay. You know, it may not be Jewish myths today, but there's still plenty of myths out there, isn't there? And there are still plenty of those who turn away from teaching the truth or the whole truth. Um, and so the predicament is just as precarious in the world we live in today. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled, corrupted and unbelieving do you remember that word we looked at that last week didn't we unbelieving what's an unbelieving person what's he not believing not believing god or his truth is it and to him how much of uh, the world is pure nothing's pure i don't know but i hear a lot of people today say that no, there's no such thing as an absolute, absolute right or wrong or truth or <clears throat> falsehood. You know, it's kind of a circular thinking deal. Um, that seems to kind of parallel. I suppose. People who carry that kind of hermeneutic, that kind of belief system, both their minds and what else? <clears throat> their consciences are defiant, are corrupt. Why? Because we serve a God of absolutes, don't we? I mean, how much darkness is in God? What did John say, First John 1 5? In Him there is no darkness, no darkness at all. Not one speck. Okay, he is absolute light. He is. Un he lives in unapproachable light. Yes, um, he's absolutely pure. He absolutely has all power, unless he vests it in someone else of his choosing. Which he has he's given it to his son right now. Power and authority, and dominion in this age. Okay, but he wants it back sometime. <laughs> But when he gets his bride, he'll say, oh, I'm done with this. He's going to give it back to the father, offer it back to the father, all that power in him. Because now he's got the bride. Um, so, God is a God of absolutes. And I'm glad he is. Because, yes. yes. <clears throat> People who want to minimize the all sufficiency of the word. Yes, as far as information, people do that. They forget that in Romans 1 and 2, mm. there's only one thing that you get a little excuse for, and that is if you've never heard of God, God expects you to be able to look around and say, There's got to be a God. You've got to be an intelligent creator. So I don't know his yeah. name. I'm not sure who he is. Right. But even there was God expects everybody to figure that out. Mm -hmm. No matter where they lived or where they came from. Now, beyond that, beyond that, if we don't have revelation, you got nothing. Right. All you got is God's out there, but I have no idea what He wants. To be. And everything else is based on superstition, isn't it? That's right. Then everything goes down the tubes. Yeah. It, you know, if you don't recognize that revelation, because the other one everybody can get yeah. just by looking around. Paul said, "You got no excuses for saying there's no God. You have no excuses for bowing down to." snakes and things like that because yeah. that's that everybody knows yeah and, and so that's what uh, that's what necessitates a, a, a revealed will of god that is dependable yes otherwise it's not fair for god to hold me responsible 
for right absolutely all kinds of things absolutely um yes thank you it's good, good um <clears throat> okay so how does he finish this chapter well he wants us to be sound in the faith in fact he wants everybody on that island to to come to a knowledge of the truth yes uh, one of the reasons that god provided a mediator for us in the first time at the um too far let me just turn back a few pages because it links in very well with second peter 3 verse 9 uh, that he wants none to perish but all to reach repentance if you read that in conjunction with first timothy 2 5 uh, well i'll start in verse 3 uh, this is good um, and it's pleasing in the sight of god our savior uh, that we might be able to pray and lead a peaceful life uh, who desires all people to be saved and to come to what so what's he automatically linking together there? Salvation. Salvation and a knowledge of the truth. So it's not enough to be saved. We need to know the one who's saving us. He wants us to know it. Who is our saviour? I don't know about you, but uh, if you've ever been saved by someone, you know, from drowning or whatever. Don't you want to know that person and thank them or you know, at least meet them? And Don't you? You know? Or are you just going to carry on your day and nothing happens? You know? Um, so I, I want to know the person who's saved me uh, because uh, I'm pretty sure he hadn't finished. <laughs> I still need it. I need that redemption every day. Um, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, mankind. Who is it? Uh, it's more than that. Uh, Jesus Christ, God being the man. That's a study all on its own. That's the testimony given at the, the proper time. Uh, I guess this is at the proper time. Back in Titus, um, those whose consciences are defiled uh, also have defiled minds, faulty thinking, and, and it corrupts, it, it affects things in a bad way. They profess to know God, he says, so who's he talking about here? I think he's talking about people in the church. Yeah. Uh, but they deny him how? Yeah, do as I say, but not as I do. So it's kind of the same thing that Jesus um, admonished or rebuked the Pharisees for, isn't it? You know, for teaching um, your traditions as if they uh, are laws. You know? And he gave them an example and said, look, now you've uh, totally emptied the, the power of the word by saying, I don't need to give this gift to my parents. And you just broke the, the fifth commandment. Well, you don't treat it that way because you put your law above <clears throat> my law. Your traditions above my, my word. So that, that's the same thing going on here. So... Did the Pharisees need a dose of humility? Humbling? Yeah, can we get like that? I think that's yeah, what's going on right now. Oh, you do? I sure do. And I hate to say your sins twice, but I don't pray that most people I run into believe there's a God, <clears throat> but the Bible is up to your own interpretation. I hear that all the time. As long as they believe there's a God, you're okay. Mm -hmm. And it's how you want to interpret the word, but to go right back to the false doctrine and receive it. There's no obligations. Mm. There's a cost to following Christ. Well, there is. A lot of people don't count it, unfortunately, but we're warned to count the cost. Aren't we? Why? Is it easy to be devoted? I mean, are you devoted to anything? 
No, because you immediately put yourself in the firing line. If you devoted to um, Texas Tech, the Raiders, or something, how do you show it? It costs you, doesn't it? Yeah, I've got to pay an extortionate prices for the guard. <laughs> Extortionate prices for the season ticket, and then you've got to go to the game. Oh no, you've got to have a it's hard to do. What do they call those open boot things where everyone can come and take your food? And... Oh, yeah, yeah, the well, it's expensive to be devoted. Why do you think it's not going to be, when I say expensive, it's not going to cost you anything to be devoted to Christ? But why do people think that? They can be devoted if they just come to church for an hour and a half on a Sunday. I think it's described as picking up your cross. Ooh. Just once. Does it sound even more oh, no. <laughs> I think I think the biggest deception is you know, if you look at the language used, the language that God uses mm. is not the language we use today. And we would never say to someone who, you know, if you said to me, you're my friend, and you said, I know God, we would never ever say, you're detestable, <laughs> disobedient, <laughs> and, right, and unfit for any good work. Well, yeah, I, we that, wouldn't say that because we are human. Right. And so that would be a bit tactless, probably. Uh, I know, but my point is that we substitute our language that is filtered down and adulterated yeah. for God's language, and we forget that that doesn't change God's language. That's that's who God is, mm. and that proves that I am so much further away from God than I thought I was. But we can deceive ourselves in thinking. And to acting like in our world, man's world, yeah. because we forget what God is but, like. We make God like us. Right. Oh, he's loving, he's just peaceful, and he's this and he's that. And we don't want to use words like that. Right. I don't want to use words like that. I mean, he says that we should have a confidence to be able to come into his throne room, but that's not because we're going in on our own. <laughs> We've got an intercessor right there again with us. So, um, but yeah, we can we can very much. I don't know because I didn't grow up here, um, and I think our monarchy has been very watered down in, in recent decades. But you know, there's if you watch the crown um, at all, certainly in the early years of the Queen's reign, it's very much. Uh, idea that you're in an incredibly special place if you're invited to an audience in the throne room. You know, say you're receiving an honor or something, a knighthood or whatever. <coughs> and really that sense of awe about the occasion is how we ought to approach God. And so much more than that. You know, I, I often read um, Hebrews 12, where uh, he says in verse 24 and following, you, you haven't come to a mountain, you know, with a dark cloud on it, and, um, you know, you, you're coming to an even greater place than uh, that scary place. I mean, it scared the living daylights out of everyone in Israel, and, and even Moses, the thunder and the fire flashing on Mount Sinai, and they said, Moses, you go and be a spokesman. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, he just got made an album there. <laughs> it's an impossible fight. Um, you know, that's a, that's a difficult that's a difficult thing. But we've come to an even greater place where there's throngs of angels and, you know, the chorus and, and, and it's more like that picture that you see in a number of places in Revelation. The throne with the elders around it, and the and the animal, you know, the lion, and the um, you know the the other angels, I guess. Really, um, it, it's a powerful scene, 
well, you just got to walk in there like, hey, man, how you doing, dude? You know, that's not, that's not how we should do that. We should have more respect for it. I kind of think sometimes we, we thought it that way. Like, and for what we can get out of it, what can I get out of it? What's going to make me feel better? You know, what's going to make me happy? What's not going to make me uncomfortable? Mm. So they deny him by their words. They're detestable, which kind of, that word when I looked at it, it has something to do with the hypocrisy. You know, they're detestable hypocrites. They are, oh, here's our word, I finally got to it, disobedient. Okay, they're disobedient, unfit for any good work. So it's a strong, it's a strong chapter, isn't it? A loving God, but a lot of warnings. So we'll finish up next week for the different study. <laughs>